spring of 1861, leaders of a new nation, the Confederate States of America, prepared for a struggle to break the bonds of union with the North. Repeated attempts at compromise had failed, and both sides made plans for what they believed would be a short war. In Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, lay a symbol of federal authority. In the early morning of April the 12th, 1861, Southern guns threw down the challenge. The bombardment continued for two days, and on the evening of April the 13th, Fort Sumter was surrendered by the Northern commander. This was the spark that engulfed the nation in the flames of civil war. Now there could be no turning back. The battle lines were quickly drawn. Eleven Confederate states from the Atlantic seaboard to Texas arrayed against 20 federal states. Between the warring sections were the border states of divided sympathy. Their sons were to be found in both of the armies. Leaders of each side were quick to realize that the great navigable rivers of the South were highways into the heart of the seceded states. And for the first time in warfare, railroads were to play a vital role in the strategy of opposing armies. Rivers and railroads combined to bring about the Battle of Shiloh. The original Confederate defensive line in the West extended from Columbus, Kentucky on the Mississippi River eastward to Bowling Green, Kentucky, and from there eastward to the Cumberland Gap in the Allegheny Mountains. Fort Henry on the Tennessee River and Fort Donelson on the Cumberland were two of the most important links in the Confederate defensive system. General Albert Sidney Johnston, a West Point graduate, resigned from the United States Army at the age of 58 and cast his lot with the South. He was entrusted with the defense of the Confederacy's western frontier between the Alleghenies and the Mississippi River. Early in 1862, events moved swiftly in the West. In February, Fort Henry fell to northern forces under Brigadier General Ulysses S. Grant. Fort Donelson was taken 10 days later the Union commander, a native of Ohio, then 39 years old and virtually unknown, won instant fame and the nickname Unconditional Surrender Grant. With the fall of the river forts, Johnston was forced to abandon Kentucky and western Tennessee. He joined Confederate General Beauregard in northern Mississippi concentrating most of the Southern Army at Corinth in order to hold the important Memphis and Charleston Railroad. Moving south on the Tennessee River came Grant's army of about 40,000 men. The Federal commander did not intend to relax his pressure on the Confederates. The Federal Army went ashore in the latter part of March to make its camps on the high ground above Pittsburgh Landing, a small steamboat landing about 22 miles north of the Confederate base at Corinth. These young men, fresh from the farms and cities of the Midwest, were new to the ways of war. Few had ever been in battle. Many of their officers were equally unprepared for the test to come. The Cherry Mansion in Savannah, Tennessee, about eight miles north of Pittsburgh Landing, became the headquarters of the Union Army on March 17th. Grant, now wearing the stars of a major general, arrived here anxious to continue his drive toward Corinth. The northern commander did not talk much, and he cut an unimpressive figure in his slouch hat and plain uniform coat. There were some who doubted his ability to command, but there were others, including President Abraham Lincoln, who knew that Grant could fight. The general was ordered to hold his troops at Pittsburgh Landing and wait for the arrival of General Don Carlos Buell's army from Nashville. Buell's force left Nashville in the middle of March, tramping slowly toward Savannah, Tennessee, more than 120 miles away. 
General Johnston planned to attack Grant before Buell could reach Pittsburgh Landing. Johnston intended to drive a wedge of troops between Grant's army and the Tennessee River, forcing the Federals into the swampy creek bottoms to the north and west. Early in April, Johnston gave orders for the advance from Corinth against Grant's army, 22 miles to the north. The Confederate force of about 44,000 men slowly advanced, its march delayed by muddy roads and confused orders. The untrained Southerners were no better prepared for battle than were their enemies. Many of the troops carried shotguns and hunting rifles. They lacked uniforms and equipment, but they trusted their commanders and trudged forward, sure that victory awaited them on the banks of the Tennessee. On the evening of April 5th, the Confederates camped in line of battle almost within sight of the Union camp scattered around Shiloh Church. In the darkness, they prepared for the fighting dawn would bring. General Beauregard, second in command of the Confederate Army, was far from confident of success. He argued that the Federals must be aware of the coming attack and said the Confederate Army should return to Corinth to fight later when there would be a better chance for victory. Johnston's determination was not shaken. He refused to consider a retreat without battle. I would fight them if they were a million, he declared, and ordered the attack to open at daylight. While in the federal camps, the young Midwesterners of Grant's army rested easily, unaware that thousands of Confederates were encamped in line of battle little more than a gunshot away. Men of Illinois, Iowa, Ohio, and Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin slept that night little dreaming that the dawn of Sunday, April the 6th, would be the last that many of them would ever see. One Union Division commander, Brigadier General Benjamin Prentiss, was not so sure that the Northern Army was safe from attack. A patrol moved out from Prentiss camps at about 3 o'clock on Sunday morning to scout the country southward toward Corinth. The eastern sky grew lighter as they moved cautiously into Fraley Field, about a mile south of Shiloh Church. At five in the morning, they met the advance guard of the Confederate Army pouring from the woods. The outnumbered Federals returned the fire. The Confederates forced the Northerners back toward their camps. The Battle of Shiloh had begun. By 9 o'clock, General Prentiss was forced to form a new line after losing his camps to the hard-charging Confederates. A sunken road, running through dense woods, offered a ready-made defensive position. And here, Prentiss determined to make his stand. Parts of two other northern divisions were in line of battle on each side of Prentiss, forming a line almost a mile long. The troops in the sunken road held the key to the battlefield. Hang on at all costs, was Grant's order to Prentiss. Here they come, grimly loading and firing. The line in the sunken road does hang on, beating back the Confederates as they try to close in. Throughout the first day's fighting, massive Confederate attacks fell upon the sunken road. The southern advance carried to within a few hundred yards of the road, and there it was stuck. The men in blue fought on, driving back wave after wave of attackers. But still, the Confederates hammered away, seeking to penetrate this federal stronghold. Hours crept by while the Southerners were held at bay by the storm of fire from the Union Center. Bullets sang around their ears like swarms of angry hornets, the Confederates said. And, as the hornets nest, the Union position on that day is known to history. 
in the peach orchard, the Confederate Army's last reserves were sent into battle by General Johnston. Now was the time for a final push to the banks of the Tennessee and victory. Petals cut down by gunfire fell like a deadly snowstorm upon the wounded and the dead. At the height of the battle near the peach orchard, General Johnston dispatched his personal surgeon to care for wounded on the field and sent away his aide, Tennessee Governor Isham G. Harris, with orders for a fresh attack. Governor Harris returned to find his chief pale and helpless. A bullet had struck Johnston in the right leg. Placing Johnston near a large oak tree in a ravine nearby, Harris desperately tried to aid the stricken commander. A surgeon was sent for, but medical aid arrived too late. The general now was hardly conscious of what took place around him. The fatal bullet had cut the main artery of Johnston's right leg. Had the wound been discovered and treated in time, it probably would not have been fatal. At about 2.30 in the afternoon, Johnston died from loss of blood at the high tide of Confederate victory. His loss would be mourned throughout the South. With Johnston's death, command of the Southern Army passed to General Beauregard. Johnston was but one of many brave men of North and South who gave their lives that day and on the next. During the fighting, the wounded made their tortured way to a small pond near the peach orchard to drink and to bathe their wounds. And there, untold numbers died. Their blood staining the still water. Despite the death of Johnston, the battle went on. The Federals on the right flank falling back toward the river. In the hornet's nest, the struggle continued without let up. The troops in blue determined to hold their position, and the men in gray equally determined to take it. The battle had raged for 10 hours. Rifle barrels were hot from rapid and steady firing. In the heavy woods, there were dozens of small battles. A man could see only a few yards beyond his position. The Confederates were held to a standstill. Their lines blasted by the deadly rifle and artillery fire that blazed from the hornet's nest. But the defenders had suffered heavily too, and the crisis of the battle was at hand. One side or the other must break, and time was running out for the defenders of the sunken road. line of massed artillery was the Confederate answer. 62 Southern cannon were posted opposite the sunken road by General Daniel Ruggles, and they opened a devastating fire on the hornet's nest. Guns were collected from every corner of the field in the largest concentration of cannon in any American battle until that time. The storm of shells burst among the Federals in the sunken road. This was the artillery's chance to do what infantry had failed to do, break the Union center and opened the road to Pittsburgh Landing. Charges were rammed down the muzzles of six and 12 pounder field pieces, howitzers and rifled guns. Load, fire, sponge the bore, reload and fire again. Swiftly, surely, the gunners worked, sighting their cannon on human targets only 300 yards away. The Southern infantry, who had lost so heavily, watched with grim satisfaction as shot, shell, and canister screamed over their heads to crash into the hornet's nest. The prize now was almost within their grasp.
In the federal ranks, ammunition was running low. The Union center was cut off from any possible help. Under the curtain of fire from Ruggles' great battery of guns, the eager Confederates swept forward along the entire front, their blood-red battle flag catching the afternoon sun. Sensing victory, men of Alabama, Tennessee, and Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas plunged through the battle smoke, heedless of the fire which tore through their ranks. It is almost 5 o'clock, 12 hours since the battle opened. The April sun is low, but there is still time to drive Grant's men into the river. The sunken road was overrun, and the yelling Southerners poured into the hornet's nest. At the last moment, General W.H.L. Wallace, commander of a division in the hornet's nest, tried to lead his men to safety and fell, mortally wounded. By 5.30, the Confederate trap had shut, encircling Prentice and more than 2,200 men in a ring of fire and steel. Further resistance was hopeless. The survivors of the fight for the sunken road dropped the weapons they had used so valiantly throughout the day. If there was bitterness in surrender, there could also be pride. The men who marched away under Confederate guard probably did not realize what they had accomplished by their day-long stand in the hornet's nest. But in years to come, they would never be ashamed to say, I fought with Prentice in the sunken road at Shiloh. Prentice's sacrifice had indeed not been in vain. With the time gained by the all-day fight in the hornet's nest, Grant was able to form a new line to the rear, covering the approaches to Pittsburgh Landing. This last line held firm and threw back the final Confederate attacks of the day. Help was on the way to Grant, for Buell and part of his army had reached Savannah. Beauregard was not aware of this. He planned to finish the battle on the following day. On the west side of the river, the division of General Lew Wallace was also on the way to join Grant. Wallace had spent most of the day in futile marching trying to find a road which would bring him to the battlefield from his camps five miles away. Dependent upon local guides and unfamiliar with the country around him, Wallace did not join Grant until late in the afternoon when the first day's fighting had ended. Vanguard of Buell's force had also reached the field, his leading division marching up the east bank of the river to a point opposite Pittsburgh Landing. Boats were on hand to hurry Buell's fresh troops across the river to join the hard-pressed, weary defenders of Pittsburgh Landing. Quickly, the word spread through Grant's line, Buell is here at last. In the gathering darkness, Buell's men marched from the landing and took position on the left of Grant's line, ready for action on the following day. The dusk that threw its lengthening shadows across the battlefield was not seen by hundreds of men who had watched the sun rise on that tragic Sunday. For these still forms, the long night had already fallen. The war was over. That night, a spring rain fell upon the dead, gray and blue alike, who lay where they had fallen. The federal gunboats Tyler and Lexington bombarded the Confederates throughout the night. Little damage was done but the salvos of heavy shells falling at 15-minute intervals throughout the night robbed the exhausted Southerners of the rest they needed so desperately. Early the following morning, the combined armies of Grant and Buell counterattacked with forces that heavily outnumbered the Confederates. The issue was no longer in doubt. And on this Monday morning, April the 7th, 1862, it was the turn of the Northerners to taste victory. At Water Oaks Pond, there was a bitter last-ditch struggle 
and more men died. The Confederates delayed but could not halt the Federal advance. The men in gray withdrew over ground they had won at such great cost on the day before. By noon, their line had fallen back almost to Shiloh Church. Southern commanders called for reinforcements, but there were none to send. The thin Confederate line could no longer hold against the Federal attack. Beauregard realized that his exhausted troops could not keep up the unequal contest. At about two o'clock in the afternoon, he ordered his army southward. The Southerners made an orderly withdrawal toward their base at Corinth, while the Federals offered only a half-hearted attempt to pursue them. and fields around Shiloh Church were silent again. This humble house of worship was destroyed after the battle, but its name will live forever in the hearts of the American people. When the fighting ended on April 7th, a tent hospital was located on the battlefield by one of General Buell's medical officers. Wounded were collected and brought here for treatment, sparing them the agonizing journey to the hospital boats at Pittsburgh Landing. This field hospital was one of the first of its kind to be established on the scene of a battle. Many wounded soldiers of both sides owed their lives to the care and shelter provided by this pioneering effort of the Army's medical service. To Beauregard's headquarters on the day after the battle came bereaved Southerners who had lost friends and loved ones in the two days of fighting. They asked that they be allowed to go to the battlefield and remove their dead. Beauregard listened sympathetically and agreed to write Grant. His letter read in part, in accordance with usages of war, I shall transmit this under a flag of truce to ask permission to send a mounted party to the battlefield of Shiloh for the purpose of giving decent interment to my dead. Respectfully, General, your obedient servant, G.T. Beauregard, General Commanding. In a short time, Beauregard's message was speeding northward through the lines to Federal Army headquarters on the field of Shiloh. The courier rode past picket guards who were now fully alert. There would be no more surprise attacks on the federal camps at Shiloh. could not comply with Beauregard's request to remove the Confederate dead, and in a brief answer explained why. Your dispatch of yesterday is just received. Owing to the warmth of the weather, I deemed it advisable to have all the dead of both parties buried immediately. Heavy details were made for this purpose, and now it is accomplished. There cannot, therefore, be any necessity of admitting within our lines the parties you desire to send on the grounds asked. I shall always be glad to extend any courtesy consistent with duty, and especially so when dictated by humanity. I am, General, very respectfully, your obedient servant, U.S. Grant, Major General Commanding. This burial trench is one of five on the battlefield in which Southern dead were placed. In it are the remains of more than 700 Confederate soldiers.
The grim accounting of the dead, wounded, and missing reveals the tragic cost of Shiloh. Almost 10,700 casualties for the Confederacy and more than 13,000 for the federal states. The Battle of Shiloh led to the fall of Corinth at the end of May, 1862. The Confederates retreated southward and the Southern Army was broken up to fight elsewhere. Early in June, Memphis was captured by the North after a gunboat battle on the Mississippi River. The fall of Corinth and Memphis opened the way for Grant's Union forces to gain possession of the Mississippi River in the following year when the capture of Vicksburg split the Confederacy and contributed in great measure to its final defeat. The Union dead who gave their lives at Shiloh that final victory might be won were removed in the year 1866 from common battlefield graves to the newly established National Cemetery. And so they passed into history. Those young men of North and South who followed their bright flags to Shiloh and left the record of their deeds forever enshrined in the hearts of a united people. Shiloh's woods and fields are silent. Beneath the flag of a united people, bronze cannons sleep in the shadows, dreaming of bugles and drums. With an eloquence beyond words, this hallowed ground tells an undying story of valor and devotion. This is the glory of Shiloh. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.